Magyana Timarandasya Kyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Kurve Namaha Nama Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namne Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Precharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschacha Deshatarine Vancha Kaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So welcome everyone to our Bhakti by Bhava study of Srimad Bhagavatam. We're on first canto and today we're looking at chapter number 12, Srimad Bhagavatam. Chapter number 12 is entitled The Birth of Parikshit. I'll just share the screen. Is everyone able to see the PowerPoint? Okay, good. So we're on Unit 4, right? Chapters 10 to 13. Review from last week. We had the description of Dwarkadam. And we compared it to the industrial metropolis of the Kali Yuga. Quite a big contrast. Dwarkadam was full of beautiful gardens and orchards, fruit trees and flowers, many birds, swans, and ducks, and <laughs> many things. It was a very picturesque abode presented for us. We spoke about different, we spoke about the importance of proper Vedic reception, different aspects which are required, particularly we mentioned prasadam distribution, food distribution should be there, there should be glorification of the Lord, these things very important in the Vedic reception. And we also heard how there are prostitutes in Dwarkadam and they're on the path of devotion. They're also devotees. They've come to receive Lord Krishna. And finally we heard about Lord Krishna's relationship with his queens in Dwarka. How Lord Krishna was a perfect husband. He would uh, follow the hus he'd follow his queens around, and he appeared just to be like a henpecked hus husband. He it, he appeared to be under the control of the queens, but it was all just as another play of his yoga maya. That the Lord is always detached from everything, but the, he was giving pleasure. He was getting taking pleasure in the company of the queens, and they were taking pleasure in his company. Okay. So we'll go ahead now. Lesson four, we're going to hear about Maharaj Parikshit. And if we run out of things to discuss in relation to Maharaj Parikshit, if we complete Maharaj Parikshit, we'll go into Vidura 
which is in the next chapter. We'll see how it goes. So first the first section of the, the first section of the chapter deals with the sages of Nanasharanya, headed by Shonaka. And they want to come back to the original topic which they'd inquired about. They wanted to hear about Maharaj Parikshit. They wanted to hear about his birth particularly and how it happened that he was cursed and Sukadeva Goswami came to enlighten him before he departed from the world. Uh, there's another another topic also there. Right? The glories of Maharaj Yudhisthira's reign. We've spoken about that in, in an earlier chapter. Chapter 10 also we'd heard something about the glories of Maharaj Yudhisthira's reign. We'll hear a bit more again today about his wonderful qualities as a leader, as a ruler. And then we'll go on to hear about Maharaj Pariksit's birth and how he was saved by Lord Krishna in the womb. And we'll hear about what happened to him. Uh, Let me just end this slide for now. I want to go into the go into the chapter. purport of the first text describes the connection with the previous chapter. We'll just read it through because it covers everything which we've talked about really in this unit so far. Srila Prabhupada writes, in the forest of Naimisharanya, uh, the sages assembled in the forest of Naimisharanya inquired from Sutta Goswami about the birth of Maharaj Parikshit. But in the course of the material, in the course of the narration, other topics like the release of the Brahmastra by the son of Drona, his punishment by Arjuna, Queen Kunti's prayers, the Pandava's visit to the place where Bhisma was lying, his prayers and thereafter the Lord's departure for Dwarka were discussed. His arrival at Dwarka and residing with the 16,000 queens, etc., were narrated. The sages were absorbed in hearing such descriptions and now they wanted to turn to the original topic and thus the inquiry was made by Shona Karishi. So the subject of the release of the Brahmastra weapon is, by Ashwatthama is renewed. Right? It had been discussed previously, come, come back to it, because so they got diverted in the course of presenting the, the birth of Maharaj Parikshit. He got diverted from the original purport. So he brought the subject back to line to hear about it again. Coming back to the PowerPoint. Are you able to see the PowerPoint still? Yes. No problem? You, okay. you can put it in full screen. 
Okay, I'm just going to do it. Yeah. Presentation mode. There you go. Yeah, it looks good. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, so coming to the birth of Maharaj Parikshit. Even in that helpless condition, the child Parikshit endured the unbearable temperature due to his being a great fighter by nature. So we see even in the womb, Maharaj Parikshit <laughs> has the mood of being Kshatriya. He's a great fighter, even in the womb, before he takes his birth. So, Interesting. So it's not sim not just that he acquired this quality of being a fighter, of being a kshatriya. It was already there from the birth. Just like it's told like that in Bhagavad Gita about Arjuna. Lord Krishna tells Arjuna, you don't have to worry, Arjun, for you are born with divine qualities. Lord Krishna was descri describing the demoniac qualities. And he, and he thought maybe Arjuna may be worried that maybe he has these qualities because he's going to fight. But Krishna tells Arjuna, you don't have to worry Arjuna, you're born, you're born with divine qualities. And Prabhupada writes in the purport, he speaks about how from the time of birth the child will develop the qualities, depends particularly on the time and the method of conception. That he, and then he talks about the importance of the samskar, the garbhadhan samskar. When the mother and father perform the garbhadhan samskar, then they attract a very good soul into the womb. So here's a quote from the third canto, third chapter, the third canto, third chapter also brings up again the birth of Maharaj Parikshit. We're still in the first canto, but we're quoting here from the third canto in the purport. The embryonic body of Parikshit, which was in formation after Uttara's pregnancy by Abhimanu, the great hero, was burned by the Brahmastra of Ashwatthama. But a second body was given by the Lord within the womb, and thus the descendant of Puru was saved. So, this is the nature of Lord Krishna, that was his mercy on the child within the womb. We heard how Uttara had approached Lord Krishna to protect her, right? Pahi Pahi Mahayogin Daiva Daiva Jagatpate, like that Uttara came running to Krishna, please save my child in the womb, let, the, let this Brahmastra weapon burn me, but save my child. So Lord Krishna is omnipotent, he's everywhere, and he certainly could also be present within the womb of Uttara. So we see here in, this, in the illustration, the artist's illustration, the child is in the embryonic form within the womb, and Lord Krishna appears with his club, forearm form with his club, and he is angry, Srimad Bhagavatam describes his eyes are red with anger and he's whirling his mace around to protect the child. However, the body of the child was burned, but the second body was given by the grace of the Supreme Lord. So the body was replaced with another body. This is the mercy of Lord Krishna saves the child. The soul is already there in the womb, so Lord Krishna gives him a new body instead of the body which has been burned by the Brahmastra. All right, so verse number 12 talks about the birth. With the birth of the child, then they want to understand, oh, well, there were different samskars which had to be done with the birth of the child. The samskars begin with the Garbhadhan samskar, and then there's other samskars during pregnancy, 
And then with the birth of the child, another samskara is required. When all the good signs of the zodiac gradually evolved, the heir apparent of Pandu took birth. Srila Prabhupada explains, The law of nature is so subtle that every part of our body is influenced by the respective stars and a living being obtains his working body to fulfill his terms of imprisonment by the manipulation of, of such astronomical influence. So, here Srila Prabhupada is mentioning about the effect of the different stars and different planets, how they influence the living entity in the time of his birth. We all know the time of birth, everyone has a particular birth chart. You're born in a particular place at a particular time when the stars are in different positions and according to that particular place and time, there will be indications of the nature of that person. As Srila Prabhupada describes here, he talks about terms of imprisonment, right? Material world, we're all imprisoned here in these material bodies. And our conditions which we're going to experience, which we're going to live in, will be influenced by these different stars. So the astronomical influence will be there. A man's destiny is therefore ascertained by the birth time constellation of stars and a factual horoscope is made by a learned astrologer. It is a great science, and misuse of a science does not make it useless. <laughs> so, Prabhupada is referring to the misuse of the astrology. He says it's a great science, but unfortunately it's often misused. Can, would you like to tell me, please, some ways in which this science may be misused? How will it be abused? Um, shall we raise hands or...? Uh, yeah, if, yeah, that'd be nice. Yeah. <laughs> My hand's up. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Tim, ask me, bro. Um, one thought that occurs to me, in the definition of uh, Uttama Bhakti, um, Jnana karma Yanavitam, that we shouldn't be covered by karma or jnana. And then the, the Acharyas also indicate we, shouldn't, we should also not be covered by astrology. So in other words, that can govern our life. There's much more than the instruction of the gurus, of, of a guru or of Krishna. And uh, that can be of misuse. Okay, that we put too much emphasis on the astrology and not enough, yeah. not enough emphasis on bhakti. Right, yeah. so it can actually cover our bhakti and uh, limit our advancement. And I'm aware of some devotees that kind of go there. <laughs> they don't do anything unless the stars are right. Um, but, you know, even our corruptive karma to some extent is, is mitigated as we um, take up bhakti, the more we go into it, the more it's mitigated. I mean, we don't get new bodies, but at least um, we get empowerment in ways that we never dreamed possible. By bhakti. By bhakti, exactly. Yeah. But if we just go by astrology, we limit our capabilities. Yeah, um, even a, a layman can cross mountains and. In, Dumb man can become a great orator. <laughs> right? Yeah, by the mercy of the Panchatattva. Right. Okay. So, a scriptural reference here. <laughs> Dan Danishwara Prabhu has a hand up. Yes, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, 
I, I was just thinking, you know, sometimes uh, when people have uh, different uh, challenges in their life, especially material challenges, then they seek an astrologer, uh, you know, to kind of uh, rectify that and look to the future and look for remedial measures. So it's not done for the purpose of attaining the supreme or pursuing spiritual life, uh, but it's more about rectifying the material situation. So I, I feel that here astrology is misused, if, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. What should, what should a person actually do when they have a crisis in their life? I think one should sincerely uh, take shelter of the Lord. Um, one should uh, try and look for a bona fide uh, person, like you know, someone within Krishna consciousness, to give them advice in terms of uh, Prabhupada's teachings and why we experience these material difficulties and what's the real solutions to it. Mm -hmm. That's just one of the thoughts that comes to my mind. So what is proper use then of this great science? Prabhupada is indicating it's a very great sorry. science, it mu must have some use. To my mind at the moment, I need to just think about it. Can I? Okay, yeah, yeah, right. Jan Mastami, you have your hand up again, yeah? I got both hands up. <laughs> no hand in <laughs> um, well, Prabhupada recommends it in several purports for a marriage. This is a way to select, very helpful in selecting a proper um, marriage partner, life partner. Mm -hmm. Okay, did you do that before your marriage? Yeah. You, um, fi you find it helpful, huh? Definitely helpful. Well, we lasted yeah. 30 plus years now, so yeah. something was right. Yeah. This, was, this was a mystic yogi astrologer from uh, Batura, and uh, so he arranged for me to meet my wife in Vrindavan itself. And I was about ready to leave to go to Soho. You know, and do Sankatan there. And then he said, but I'm leaving tomorrow. And he said, we'll meet her today. <laughs> and um, the, the, uh, the devotees, the temple management in Vrindavan used to use this mystic yogi if there was a theft, say, in the guest house. They would use him to find out where the money is. And he would always come through on it. So it was a unique combination of um, mystic yogiism and uh, astrology. Oh. He had done. He put you together, was it? Yeah. The mystic. I there, you see my astrological chart. It's quite a story. I don't know if we want to take time for it now, but uh, it's pretty pretty remarkable. And there's a. Uh, he has on the Brickham Mark now a temple. I can't can't think of his name now. But hmm. anyway. Yeah. Anybody else has any experience in this dealing with astrologers? Hare Krishna Mahaprabhu. Yes, Hare Krishna, Maharaji. It's Vasurani from uh, South Africa. Maharaj, I'd just like to um, offer my personal opinion, but I'm just not sure if it may be correct. I personally believe that, um, well, from what I've read and from what I've learned, is that if you are a devotee and if you are chanting the holy name of Krishna, and if you have 100% uh, faith and surrender to the Lord, then um, Krishna plays a direct role in your life. So which means that the astrology in the sense of the alignment of the stars, etc., by Krishna's management could change. And I, before becoming a devotee, um, when I met my husband, Raski Haridas, when we had gone to a uh, Kamakanda priest, in South Africa, they had advised that we were not compatible and that we should not get married. <laughs> believe it or not, Mahat, at that time, we were not, I mean, I was exposed to Krishna consciousness, but our identity was not serious. 
And I would say at that time, just out of pure love, so to speak, for each other, we actually just got married and defied the so-called astrology, astrology predictions. And now we are married for 18 years. So I think um, being a devotee and chanting Krishna's name and having surrender, in my opinion, I think would play a little bit of a bigger role than astrology itself. Right. Yes. Thank you, Maharaj. Very good. Thank you so much, Mariji. Very nice. Mahavira Rupa Prabhu has his hand up. Hare Krishna. Uh, Uh, the audibility is not good, Mahavir Prabhu. Okay, so uh, I will get a microphone because there is some problem. Uh, meanwhile, uh, somebody else can say something. Uh, I will just get a microphone. Okay, Prabhu. Yeah. Okay, Chandrika Maharaji has her hand up. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, I can give some to make funny example from our yatra. One of our Prabhus um, was very attached to this science and once he asked the astrologer, uh, is it a good time for distributing books now? <laughs> to distribute books now. <laughs> and yeah, this is an example for me for improper using um, this science. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. <laughs> that, that's a, that's a not proper way to make use of the science, right? Thank you. <laughs> yeah. There is a time, actually, in the course of the day, they have a, every day there's a period called, uh, what is it? M Kala, 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 the, the, and there's, there's this inauspicious time in the day. One temple I was at, they, were, they would announce every morning, what time does Kala, the, what time does the Kala begin? Kala, in the, in the course of the day, when the Kala begins, and it's an inauspicious time. So, they're always very careful not to go out on Sankirtan at that time, go before or go after. And, and, and also, don't do any yagya, no, no yagyas at that time. One devotee even has a website, it's called Good Times, Bad Times. And he guides people about auspicious times for doing different things. There are, in the course of the day, good times and bad times. And Prabhupada also was conscious of it, you know. I heard from Tejas Prabhu, who was a, you know, at one point he was in charge of Delhi, and he was a temple president there in Delhi. And he told me that Prabhupada would never leave on a journey on Thursday afternoon. That was considered very inauspicious. And so if Prabhupada was supposed to leave on a Thursday afternoon, he would have the bag packed beforehand and he'd put the bag outside the door. And if he was still, you know, he was still there, but in a sense he'd gone because the bag was packed and placed outside the door. So Prabhupada was a little conscious about some of these things, that there's some times which are good, and some times which are bad. And certainly with marriage, then it's something which you, it certainly seems to pay, help people a lot when they have their, if they, if they are compatible, but as Mariji just said, it doesn't have to be like that. If they're both very Krishna conscious, if they're very Krishna conscious, mature devotees, then it doesn't matter. And astrology, astrology is not 100%. It's only a guide. It's, it's, it can help us to understand something. But I have seen some devotees who got married and very, very successful because they had they had a good chart, compatibility, and it, it worked. But I saw also devotees who had good compatibility 
and the marriage didn't work. There was one couple, we had, uh, the couple were married, they had two children, and then they divorced. But they were, they were like a, almost 100% compatible. But still, the marriage broke up. And we do see the opposite. Sometimes the couple are not compatible, but, some, but they can be happy together because of their mature Krishna consciousness. So... Prabhupada uh, would sometimes, in the beginning of our movement, Prabhupada would arrange marriages, but he became disappointed that the marriages didn't always work out, and the couples were not mature. And then he stopped, he said, you arrange your own marriages from now on. Hmm. Yes, Janmashtami Prabhu? Uh, one last point. The, the I think that's the first astrologer in our movement, the Prabhupada disciple Nalini Kanta from uh, L.A. He predicted, <coughs> excuse me, to the day when I would meet my wife, like about, um, I think it was about nine months before. So that was a pretty remarkable thing. And then I had another astrologer that said, your chart and her chart are a perfect match. You should marry. <laughs> My, my my wife had just gone to see that astrologer two day two or three days before, so it was fresh in his memory. <laughs> okay, so sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. The the point is, you have it's not a hundred percent. It can be a help, but it's not one hundred percent. Now, Prabhupada did have some experiences with astrologers. What did the astrologers say about Prabhupada? Anybody remember? Yep. Yeah. Din Dineshwara Prabhu? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, the astrologer predicted uh, Srila Prabhupada would become a sannyasi uh, when he was uh, 869 across the ocean and uh, he'll build up 108 temples. And it also takes Vedic teachings throughout the world. Okay. Quite a big, quite a prediction to make about someone, huh? Absolutely. And it, um, we know also uh, Bhavananda Prabhu, he's quoted in one of these. Uh, I think it's in your ever well wisher, the movie about Prabhupada. He said that they showed Prabhupada's picture to some man and when they saw when he saw Prabhupada's face, then he said just from Prabhupada's face he said this man can, can build a house in which the whole world can live. And Bhavananda tells when he told this to Prabhupada. Prabhupada smiled and said, yes, that is my dream. <laughs> so, I heard also, there was one astrologer, some devotee had gone to visit one, well, very well, competent astrologer in Delhi. And when the astrologer saw that he was, this person was a devotee, he said, you know, I cannot tell you what your future is. I cannot tell you about your life because you're a devotee, because you're engaging in devotional activities. So your destiny is, it's all changed. Everything is changed. That you're no longer, you don't have the same karma anymore because you're doing bhakti yoga. So your karma is all changed. But on the material platform, you know, if one is not engaged in devotional activities, then you can get a good indication of the nature of someone. I think the Gurukula boys, the traditional Gurukula boys, that the, the teachers there often examine the chart of the boys. They want to see what kind of astrological chart the boy has before they accept the child into the Gurukula. Is that true? Anybody know? 
I don't remember that happening in my case with my son. No? It, okay. Did both your boys go to Gurukula? Well, one boy was living in the ashram but was Smith, and the other boy went to the Bhaktivedanta Academy, and they're like strictly Vedic. But I don't recall that they checked his chart. Oh, okay. Maybe, you know, I'm, I can't remember everything. Mm -hmm. well, one, another thing, you know, is that um, it does, what my experience is and others, that, you know, we still get, um, we still have vestiges of the enjoying spirit. So to some extent, we get reactions that are like karmic reactions, although they're not. They're directly given to us by Krishna. But that, in, that, that need to get purified of the enjoying spirit, you know, comes in this form, you know. So some, it, it oftentimes is quite parallel what the astrological chart would say and what, you know, the devotees experience. It's that, you know, someone's on the um, Mahabhagavat level, then that's a different thing. Yeah. But even you got someone like Srila Prabhupada, you know. <laughs> Look at his chart, you know, I mean, pretty, pretty remarkable predictions. It also seems to have a lot to do with the qualification of the astrologer in this day and age. The qualification probably is not as great as it used to be. Um, there's just so many opinions out there and so many different ways of going about it, so many different astrological gurus. Yeah. Yeah, we do have some, We, I know... His Holiness Banu Swami is a bit of an astrologer. He like he often looks at people's charts, and gives them some advice. I saw one man. Uh, he was a well, there was one man who was a devotee, and he was also an astrologer, but he had terrible times himself. Everything went wrong in his life. His marriage broke up, he had three children, but his marriage broke up and his wife left him, uh, just finished everything in his material life. And he was the astrologer and <laughs> there was no sign, that he, there was no, he, didn't, he, he wasn't aware about his own life, couldn't control his own life. I, I don't know how he could manage to guide others. So, astrology is a science, one has to know how to use it properly. It can be helpful maybe to direct what kind of uh, like occupation one should take up, what kind of varna one is suited for, that may be visible from the chart. And you can understand, you know, what, what, what one is better suited for, what kind of engagement, what kind of work one should do, how much one is inclined to study and how much one is more inclined to physical work. So these things may be more visible by astrological charts. We know also in Prabhupada's final year, when Prabhupada was in Vrindavan, and other times also, Prabhupada would send people, go and see the astrologer. When Prabhupada was in Vrindavan, you know, it wasn't clear, how, is Prabhupada going to recover, is he going to get better, what's going to happen? And Prabhupada would say, what do the astrologers say? And different devotees would go to see astrologers, and they would come back and tell Prabhupada what they said. You know, like one astrologer said, Oh, Swamiji, he should get a ruby, he should wear a ruby on the second finger, like this, you know, something like this. And, but Prabhupada said the real, the real cure, the real medicine was the holy name. He would sometimes laugh when he heard some of the advice given by astrologers. Anyway, with the birth of Maharaj Parikshit, the astrologers were brought in and they want to know what kind of child is this going to be because he's coming in the line of the great kings. Is he going to be a good king or is he going to be another Venu? 
They want to know what he's going to be like. And so these astrologers all came and they're asked to give advice. Tell, make predictions. Oh, okay, let's see. Prabhupada explains, there is a need for a good and intelligent class of brahmanas who are expert in performing the purificatory processes prescribed in the system of Varnashram Dharma. So Prabhupada is talking about the need for a class of brahmanas who are expert in performing these purificatory processes, in other words the samskars prescribed in the system of Varnashram Dharma, the different samskars, samskars are for purification of the existence of the person. So the brahmanas are meant, they should be expert in guiding and instructing people and doing these things. And I think the, the traditional Gurukula, which we have here in Mayapur, is working in that direction, they want to produce a class of brahmanas who can perform these different things. Installing deities, we have seen when they have a big deity installation, they often send a group of students to go and do the deity installation. And they do it very elaborately, very nicely. And so they're, they're trained brahmanas. And they're very expert. And installing deities is one of the functions. Of course, you don't do that very often, but there are many other things to be done. We see also the Vivaha, Vivaha Yagya, the marriage ceremony. Uh, actually, just the other evening I was invited over to the Jagannath Mandir. One of the senior managers here in Mayapur was married and uh, they had the devotee Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu from the traditional Gurukula. He's one of the senior teachers there. So he was doing the Vivaha Yagya and he did it so nicely. He, he explained in detail everything, all the different rituals and ceremonies which were being performed. And he chanted the mantras with such proficiency it was really a very nice ceremony. So in performing these different activities, the, the priest has to be very qualified. You have to have a really qualified person. It makes a big difference, the person who does a yagya, that they have to be really qualified, they have to be pure. Too often you, you find the... In, 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 Outside of, if you go outside of ISKCON, the people who do the yagyas, they're so-called brahmanas, they're brahmanas by birth, but they have no good qualities. They drink, they smoke, they do everything wrong. They don't follow any rules and regulations, but they come in the name that, oh, we're brahmanas, and, and they do the yagya. They know some mantras, a few mantras. But even the, the mantras which they use will all be Karmakandi mantras. They won't be Vaishnava for, according to the Vaishnava Sampradaya. They will be all just Karmakandi mantras, things which they've heard. So it's really important that we do have a class of Brahmanas who can do these things and who can perform these different samskars and, and this way the purpose of the yagya is there. What is the real purpose of these yagyas ultimately? The purpose is what? Somebody can tell me what, what's the purpose of all of these different yagyas? Yes to satisfy the Supreme Lord and to purify the existence. We don't, uh, uh, 
ordinary, ordinarily people don't think the yagyas are like that. They, th they think it's all for their material purpose. That, oh, that, yeah, we'll have a long life, we'll have a lot of sense gratification, we'll have a, you know, we'll live happily together without any anxiety, Krishna will give us all the money we need, we'll be happy. They're thinking like that. They're not thinking about spiritual progress. But when Srila Prabhupada would perform a marriage ceremony, then he would say, you should help each other to advance spiritually. Right? That's the real purpose of marriage, for spiritual advancement. Often people forget this. They're, they simply think in material reasons. They're thinking for my sense gratification. Not, so we, we try to crack people, to bring people into Krishna consciousness, to get them to understand the real purpose of all of these different rituals and yagyas for purification of consciousness. So the brahmanas, they have to be qualified, and the participants in the yajna, they also have to be qualified. They should also be properly guided and instructed. Then you can get the proper result. Generally we find when the child is born, the only samskar they do, anaprasna. Even the devotee couples, the only samskar, the first samskar they do is the anaprasna, when the baby is six months old, then they want to feed the grains. The other samskars they never do. Garbhadan samskar is very rarely done. And the jatikarn, the, the one at the time of birth, that's also not done. And during the pregnancy, if they don't do but when the child is about six months, they think, okay, Anaprashna, bring the baby along, feed grains. Now mother can feed grains to the baby, so it's less trouble. So these samskars are, they definitely do have an effect. They do help to elevate the soul, the consciousness, and to give a better life. It's not just some ritual for material purposes, it's for spiritual benefit. So the brahmanas, they have that duty to perform. They have to be expert, they have to be pure, they have to be following the principles also. Then you can get good results. Okay, here's some more about some scars of Sanatan Dharma from the purport. The Brahmanas were not therefore poor in the actual sense of the term. On the contrary, because they possess gold, land, villages, horses, elephants and sufficient grains, they had nothing to earn for themselves they would simply devote themselves to the well-being of the entire society. Uh, often people, they don't want to be a brahmana, they think, oh, I, I, a brahmana is not going to be, he won't make any money. Brahmanas are all poor. <laughs> but Prabhupada explains, they're not actually poor. They're rich. They're rich in knowledge, and they're rich in culture, and People, when people actually appreciate the brahmanas, then they will reward them for their services. They will give them these things like gold and land, villages, horses, elephants, grains. They'll be happy to give these things to the brahmanas because they've done, they've done their service very nicely. They've helped a person to benefit spiritually as well as materially. So in this way the brahmanas can, they can be very satisfied. Being a brahmana doesn't mean you have to be poor. Brahmanas can be also very wealthy people.
The conclusion is that the intelligent men or the brahmanas specifically engaged in the service of the Lord were properly maintained without anxiety for the needs of the body. And the king and other householders gladly looked after all their comforts. One country which I preach in is Thailand. Thailand today is a Buddhist country and the king there is a Buddhist. Oh, the king, the last king died a few year, couple of years ago. We have a new king. So it's a Buddhist country and the law is that the king has to be a Buddhist. But the country was initially, or originally, it was a Hindu country. And they still have some Hindu temples there. And there are still Brahmanas. The king also has Brahmanas. And every year they do rituals, they do yagyas every year. And the Brahmanas will come and they have special, they have royal, royal oxen which plough the field. And the, they will come, they will plough the field and the Brahmanas will make prediction what the year will be like. They will describe if this is going to be a good year or a bad year for the economy. <laughs> so the king, he still maintains Brahmanas and he still, they have a Vishnu temple. Although they're all Buddhists, they still have the Vishnu temple there and they still have the Brahmanas. And the king also will, will con consult the Brahmanas, they will guide him. So this, this is the original Vedic society. The, 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 the ruler understands the importance of the Brahmanas that they can guide them, he can, the brahmanas can give the proper information. And so the brahmanas are kept happy, they're nicely maintained, they have no anxiety, no problems, everything is provided. Because they do very important service, very nice service. So the, the ruler is happy to provide for them. Okay, continuing the chapter. Maharaj, could I, could I make a question? Okay, uh, yeah. Um, there are quite a few references where Prabhupada indicates how for a Vaishnava, Krishna will take away his uh, material possessions uh, so that he can advance in Krishna consciousness. Like, for instance, 10.88.8. There's the one that had real impact on Srila Prabhupada when he discovered it. You know, the translation goes something like this. When I feel especially mercifully disposed towards someone, I gradually take away his material opulence, and then his friends and relatives then reject this poverty-stricken and most wretched fellow. And the Prabhupada, he had all these different reversals in his businesses, and so he said to a god brother, do you think Krishna's doing this to me? You go, yep, yeah, it seems that way. So there is that other side of the coin, and then, you know, this is more, it seems this is kind of like on a more advanced stage than Krishna will take away. But, you know, preliminarily, you know, as one's progressing in his spiritual life, then things come in, in, in great abundance. Of course, Prabhupada then became a multimillionaire with all the temples. <laughs> That's right. You give up one thing to get much more. But the point is that you don't have to have everything taken away. It's a question of what Krishna wants you to do. That sometimes the Brahmana himself can be situated without attachment. He's not attached to whatever is given to him. He's just simply doing his duty as a Brahmana. He's engaged in the service of the Lord and the Lord may be providing for him, giving him wealth, giving him up. He doesn't want it, he, but Krishna gave it to him, so he accepts it. He accepts it without attachment, right? Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Bhogaisvarya prasaktanam taya parita chaitasam vayavasa. 
in, in the minds of those who are attached to material opulence and sense gratification, then the resolute determination for devotional service does not take place. But that doesn't mean you cannot have material opulence and sense gratification. You can have it, but don't be attached to it. So the, if they're brahmanas, they're not attached to what they have. It's given to them by the grace of the Lord. They accept it. Just like Sudama was given the opulence after he went to Dwarka, he was given opulence. He accepted it all in the mood of renunciation. Krishna doesn't say you cannot have it. Whatever you have, you can use it in the service of Krishna. Right? It's not, that, not that you have to give it up. Krishna wanted Prabhupada to preach. Krishna wanted Prabhupada to go, to get out from the home and to go and preach. Therefore, Krishna took everything away. But not every brahmana is meant for that. The brahmanas, they don't, not, not every brahmana is going to be a paribrakacharya, to go traveling everywhere preaching. That was a, a very special, very rare case. So, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to discourage people from being brahmanas. We do see a lot of people, they, they, were, they were born in brahmana families, but they considered worshipping the deity, they considered worshipping the deity, oh no, there's no money, I won't be able to have a good life. They think materially. They don't think about their actual condition spiritually. They simply think about material opulence, sense gratification. But brahmanas can also have this. We see an, there are a number of devotees in our movement. They're brahmanas, they do the brahmanical duties, they teach. And they're very, very comfortable, very happy. Everything is provided for them. They do very nicely. And, and they have some of these brahmanas, they, they, they're, they're in family life and they have several children. But they have no difficulty maintaining their children, maintaining their families. They're brahmanas. And they accept whatever is provided by the grace of Krishna. And we do see there's some very nice devotees in the Krishna conscious community, who are real Brahmins. They're very Paka Brahmins. We know all the mantras, all the rituals, all the ceremonies, and they just live like that. And this way they can maintain themselves. Not everybody has to go to and sit in the multinational corporation office. Not everyone has to go to the factory. And Prabhupada also talks in the purport, he mentions about Dronacharya and Kripacharya. What were they teaching? Uh, how to fight. <laughs> yeah, they were teaching the military arts, warfare, how to do these things, how to use the different weapons. Actually, and I remembered the last class, somebody was asking about Kripacharya previously. The question came up, the Kripacharya. He said, how is he here? Kripacharya fought against Krishna, right? Kripacharya was fighting on the other side from Krishna and he was there when they disrobed Draupadi, but still, he's still there. After everything's over, with the birth of Pariksit, Kripacharya also comes. And Prabhupada talks about it how Kripacharya is there, that he's a priest, he's, and he, he just, it, it mentions there, Prabhupada mentions, he said, Dhritarashtra had given Kripacharya to the Pandavas, that Kripacharya would guide them during their exile, when they had to go into exile for 12, 12 years, was it? But then at that time Kripacharya was guiding them, he was like their guru. So there's a section about Kripacharya and he's still there, he, <laughs> present in many of these different things, different 
events which took place. So Brahmanas can teach whatever they know they teach. Barijan Prabhu told us, maybe you remember this Janmashtami, Barijan Prabhu when he was teaching us many years ago, he was telling us, he said, he got a job as a young devotee, he got a job and he got a job in, in a brick factory and he was very excited about it and he came back because he was living with the devotees and he came back and told Prabhupada, he said, Prabhupada, he said, I've learned how to make bricks. And Prabhupada said, oh, this is very nice. He said, you must also teach this to others now. Very good. You teach it to others. So this is the point that a Brahmana, whatever he knows, he will teach it to others. Somebody's a good cook, teach it to others. Somebody's good in worshipping the deity, you teach it to others. Somebody knows the mantras, the samskars, teach it to others. Whatever you know, you teach it, you don't just keep it for yourself, you give it, you share it with others. This is the Brahmana, Brahmana and Kripana, right? Kripana is the opposite. The Kripana, the miserly person, he has, he may have so much, he won't share, he won't give to anybody, never gives any charity, very miserly. This is Kripana. But Brahmana is generous, he will give everything. Even Dadichi gave the bones of his body for others. Okay, any other questions or points on this section before we go on? Hi, Krishna Maharaj. Can I ask uh, two quick questions? Please. Uh, thank you. Maharaj, is there a book you could recommend on uh, some scars that we could read uh, to, to, get our, to get more information on this particular subject matter? Uh, and shall I ask the second question now? Or well, th there is a book published about some scars. Uh, I've seen it. Over, I, I, I even had a copy myself at one point, I don't know where I've left it now, but I know there was a book published, the title was Some Scars, and it was published I, I think maybe by devotees here in Mayapur, but certainly there is a book, and if you look, if you go to maybe the Namhata Bhavan, the book shop there and there, they have a lot of books there, you may be able to find it, or if you talk to, if you talk, are you in Mayapur? Oh, you're in South Africa. Okay, so... Uh, and, and that's a Tirta teaches it, you know, and uh, he, I, I could send um, his email address to you, Prabhu. Thank you, Prabhu. It will be appreciated. He, he, can, he can key in on it. I know uh, Radhika Nagar was in training for the Samskaras with Uzanata Tirta. He's in Australia now because of the lockdown. Yes, Ananda Tirtha was in the Gurukul. He grew up in the Gurukula here in Mayapur, so he was well trained in the samskars. And he ch his very perfect pronunciation, his Sanskrit is very, very nice. So he does teach it, you can learn from him. There, we do have a number of qualified devotees to do samskars, and the book is there, samskars, you can get that book. It's very detailed. Okay, thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Prabhu. What uh, other like question? Second question. Um, I wanted to know, Maharaj, what's your thoughts on, you know, sometimes if uh, devotees purchase a house, a new house or a vehicle, um, and should, should devotees be performing yajyas, for example, if they purchase a new house or you know, to do a prayer if you purchase a new vehicle. What's your thoughts on these type of things? <laughs> yeah, well, we, we do have these rituals going on. Yeah, it's true. Uh, they get a, you get a new house and they do a thing called Greha Pravesh, which is a ceremony done before entering the new home. The Greha Pravesh. The, uh, the devotees do this. Uh, we do this in a, a devotional manner. We have the, you know, the... They make a fire yagya and then they have kirtan and they uh, distribute nice prasadam to everyone, feed everyone, satisfy the brahmanas. So it's, it's customary, you get in your home, you have a little ceremony and 
you invite people to come and they, they, they do some rituals like tie a, a, a thread or a rope or something around the house and, and you cut the rope, you come in and you, do, you bring in different items and go to different rooms and sprinkle some holy water, things like this, and chant some mantras. Though it's nice, it certainly has the concept of appreciating the, the Lord, recognizing that this home is the, the residence of the Lord, and it's given by the Lord for the service of the Lord. So, okay, you, reckon, you, you, you do this kind of ceremony, it's very nice, very proper, in the Vaishnava way. Right? But we're not karma kandis, but we do it for the pleasure of Krishna, to bring Krishna, make a nice home for Krishna. Because in moving into a house, there will be some karma there, there's going to be karma from the past, the people who built the home or the people who lived there before, you want to purify the home before you come to live in it. And the way to do it is by doing this little ceremony, particularly by the chanting of the holy name. Now, just like in Vrindavan, when they installed the deities in Vrindavan, they did many rituals. And Prabhupada said, actually, the real installation of the deities wasn't done by the brahmanas, the, the, you know, the Brijbasi brahmanas who came and did the puja, but the real installation was done by the devotees through the kirtan, through the chanting of the holy name. So in every ceremony which we may perform, you know, we may perform some rituals. Prabhupada had the devotees do this in Vrindavan. He had the, they hired the Brijbasi brahmanas to come and do the installation of the deities. He said, this is just for the minds of the local people, so that they will be peaceful, that they see the brahmanas come and they do it, so they're happy. He said, but actually the real installation is done by the devotees, by the chanting of the holy name, by kirtan. And so similarly with a new home, you want to purify the home, you invite the devotees to come and you have kirtan and you distribute prasadam and satisfy everyone. That's very nice. You have a car, you know, people have a car, they also want to protect the car, they don't want any accidents or unforeseen things happening. <laughs> so some, they do, sometimes we, I have seen people do these different rituals for motor cars or motorbikes. It's quite common among the Hindu population to do these kind of things. But ultimately we're in the hands of Krishna. We really have to depend on Krishna and the real the real ritual is to chant the holy name and to serve the devotees, serve the Vaishnavas. So you want to perform a ritual, it's maybe just more for someone's mental satisfaction that I did the puja, okay, I remembered the Lord, we did a little puja and you give some charity to the Brahmana who did the puja, okay. But the real thing is to chant the holy name and to worship Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Wonderful. Merle Manahar Prabhu, he posted on the chat the book, so you can just click on it and go to the website or the, the internet where you can get it. Wonderful. Thank you, Prabhu. Also, the one thing Maharaj they said, um, um, Vishal, a long-time resident of Vrindavan, recently left his body. Um, but he um, he had um, gone to an astrologer in Vrindavan and he came back with all of these, um, like this necklace with these um, different pennants on it to um, pacify the demigods. And Prabhupada chastised him. You may remember hearing that past time. I can't remember exactly what Prabhupada said, but it was something like, um, with one kick of his with one kick of his foot, Krishna can take care of all of his karmas, <laughs> something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I never heard this actually about Vishal. No, I never heard this past time. It's a new one for me. But I know about Guru Kripa, and Guru Kripa was preaching in Japan, and he had the Sankirtan party, and they were collecting, and the money was going for Bombay, to build Bombay and to build Vrindavan. And they were doing quite well, 
you know, in those days, it was 1970s, and the money was coming from book distribution. So the devotees were out there in Japan on the streets, and they were collecting money. And Guru Kripa got an inspiration. He wanted to worship Ganesh, right? Because there were many obstacles, you know, obstacles where they were foreigners, and they were collecting money in the street. So they were illegal, and some of them, sometimes they would get arrested and sent out. And so he was, he asked Prabhupada, can, can we worship Ganesh? And Prabhupada told him, he said, if you want to worship Ganesh, you have to give me $10,000 every month. I think, I think it was, or maybe it was $100,000 every month. It was a huge amount, a big amount, a really big amount every month. He said, then you can worship Ganesh. <laughs> so... Prabhupada didn't, didn't really encourage the worship. And we see, although worship of Ganesh is mentioned in the Nectar of Devotion, and it's also there in the seventh canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, that we should not neglect to worship Vaikuntha deities like Ganesh. <laughs> Things like this are there. But Prabhupada never put any Ganesh in our, any of our temples. And Prabhupada was very cautious about this. He didn't want to introduce the worship of the devas. He wanted the emphasis should go on Krishna and Krishna Bhakti. And one time a Chutananda, at that time he was a Chutananda Swami, he said to Prabhupada, he said about the temple in Hyderabad in Andhra Pradesh, they were there, and in Andhra Pradesh, Hyderabad, most people are followers of worshippers of Shiva. So he said, Prabhupada, if we put a Shiva Linga here, everyone will come to the temple. But Prabhupada said, yes, everybody will come and they will think Shiva, Gornitai, Radha Madan Mohan, Jagannath Baladev Subhadra, they're all one. They're, they'll think they're all the same. He said, we don't want to encourage that. He said, they already have enough Mayavadi thinking in them. We don't want to encourage that. So the Mayavadi thinking, all the gods, they're all one. So Prabhupada was very clear to keep the emphasis on Krishna Bhakti, and he never installed any demigods. And of course that worship of demigods is condemned by Naratam Das Thakur. Naratam Das Thakur said, you worship demigods, you can never go back to Godhead. Okay, so we have to be a, a cautious because when you do rituals, oftentimes the rituals mean you, they bring in different gods, different devas, and like that. They want to this god, that god. You just simply need Krishna consciousness. The real yagya in this age, Kali Yuga Dharma, Harinam, Sankirtan. There's no other yagya. The real yagya is chanting the holy name. We don't need any of these other rituals. The real ceremony is in the chanting of the holy name. And Prabhupada encouraged that completely, totally. But just like I said in Vrindavan, for the sake of the local people, okay, let these brahmanas do some ritual. And even he told Prajumna, he said, you go and learn from them how to do it in the future. We'll do it ourselves. Just do it. The, the ritual is the show, but the real substance is the chanting of the holy name. It's not the fire yagya. It's not all these Vedic mantras. It's the chanting of the holy name. Maharaj, um, just one last point maybe on this. The, uh, the Sran Goswami and the Hari Bhakti Vilas yeah. was um, under the direction of, uh, of um, Lord Chaitanya. You know, they, that he created the Hari Bhakti Vilas to kind of bridge the gap, you know, with the Smarta Brahmanas in oh. Vrindavan and introduce uh, Vaishnavism. Uh huh. Something along those lines. Uh, th th there's a little confusion who the actual author is, whether it's Nat Goswami or. What? Hari Bhakti Vilas? Yeah, Hari Bhakti Vilas. Usually he's given the credit, but there's another one that Goswami that I can't remember which one. Um, anyway, yeah, yeah. That, the, was, uh, that was part of the rationale behind it, that type of uh, entering, because otherwise the smart brahmanas would, would be uh, 
it was so massive. There, um, Gopal Bhatta, there was a, a chat came up on the pet chat. I was right. <laughs> Gopal okay, Bhatta. Of course, Gopal Bhatta was from South India and he was from the Sri Vaishnava family. So he was aware of that. Yeah. But yeah, in the purports, Prabhupada speaks about the Pancharatriki system. He said, we follow the Pancharatriki system, the Vaishnava mantras. We don't follow the Vedic rites. We don't do Vedic rites. We don't follow like a, the Manu Samhita. We do Pancharatriki mantras, the, 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 which are prescribed by the Goswamis, the proper mantras are for us, for the Kali Yuga, are the Pancharatriki mantras, not the Vedic rites. The Vedic rites is for, just for Brahmanas. You need Brahmanas, only Brahmanas can chant the Vedic mantras, you know, cast Brahmanas. But we don't follow this, that system. We're not following the Vedic rites. We're doing the Pancharatriki system, which is for everyone. Everybody can chant. Everybody can chant the holy name. Everyone can take part in Sankirtan. So Lord Chaitanya came to give that. He came to benefit the world, not just the Brahmanas. But Brahmanas have a role to play. They're important. And so, here we see the chapter goes on. The Brahmanas glorify the future qualities of Maharaj Parikshit. The Brahmanas, they do their calculations according to the time of the birth of the child. And from that, they can predict the qualities. Just like if you calculate the actual time of the birth of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu or Lord Sri Krishna, you can understand that the, the child who came is actually the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In the Chaitanya Charitamrita, there's a one Leela where an astrologer came to visit the home. An astrologer came to visit the home of Lord Chaitanya. Do you remember that, the pastime? The astrologer came to the home of Lord Chaitanya, Nimai Pandit at the time. So Lord Chaitanya told him, he said to the Brahma, the astrologer, tell me, who was I in my previous life? And so then the astrologer sat and he did his calculation or meditation. I can't remember what it was, either one or the other. Anyway, after he'd finished, he said, ah, he said, I understand that you were the Supreme Lord, the Lord of the whole cosmic manifestation. And Lord Chaitanya said, no. He said, my previous life, I was a cowherd boy. <laughs> so, like that, you, if you, you know, those astrologers, they, they can do charts. You actually see at the time, the actual time of the birth of Lord Krishna, 5,000 years ago, at that point of midnight, on that day, Janmastami, that only the Supreme Personality of Godhead could take birth at that time because everything was just so perfect. The position of each and every star and planet was just so perfect. The alignment was there that only the Supreme Lord could appear at that time. So the Brahmanas, they, do, they want to look at the qualities of Maharaj Parikshit and they make predictions. And then the second, the, at the end of the chapter, we hear about Maharaj Yudhisthira performing a sacrifice to atone for his own sins. Right? That's the final section. So the qualities of Maharaj Parikshit. What kind of qualities do you want for your son? <laughs> what kind of qualities do you want? Interesting. Did you did you have a chart done for your children when they were born, Jan Mastani? Yeah, yeah. You had you checked out their chart, huh? I don't remember. You see, my wife is the one that pays a lot of attention to it, and I don't so much. Okay. So my, my first son was born in the Shringa <laughs> and uh, it's pretty amazing, um, very auspicious, and um, so naturally we called him Prahlad, <laughs> gave him that name. 
Okay. I, I can't remember details. My wife was always in charge of that department. <laughs> um, also, my second son, they got charts. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so here are some of the qualities of Maharaj Parikshit. You know, they go on and on. I mean, they, <laughs> it's all, all good, you know, everything is so good, you know. A great bowman like Arjun, irresistible as fire, unsurpassable as the ocean, strong as a lion, sheltered like the Himalayan mountains, forbearing like the earth, tolerant as his parents. <laughs> My goodness, wonderful. Like Yudhisthira or Brahma in equanimity of mind, munificent like the Lord of Kailash, Shiva, the resort of everyone, like the Supreme Lord, as good as Lord Sri Krishna in following his footsteps, in magnanimity as King Ranti Dev, in religion like Maharaj Yayati, like Bali Maharaj in patience, a staunch devotee like Prahlad, a performer of Ashwamena sacrifices, a follower of the old and experienced men, the father of kings who will be like sages, the chastiser of the upstarts and the quarrelsome. So here's an interesting quote from Srila Prabhupada, actually from Jiva Goswami. And in the picture you can see here, Srila Prabhupada instructing, this is Dwarkadish Prabhu, he was a very famous child in the Gurukula, Originally he was in the Gurukula in Dallas, later on they came to Vrindavan. Dwarkadish has grown up now. I think he's still active in Krishna consciousness, but he got a lot of mercy from Srila Prabhupada. You can see Srila Prabhupada guiding his hand to write letters. So Prabhupada quotes Jiva Goswami that in this connection that Every child, if given an impression of the Lord from his very childhood, certainly becomes a great devotee of the Lord, like Maharaj Parikshit. And so, in the purport, Prabhupada describes himself about his own life. And Prabhupada talks about his own impressions that as a child, that his father brought him deities of Radha and Krishna and he said he was about, he was very young at the time, maybe five years old and he would worship them along with his sister. And Prabhupada describes, he said as a child he would go to the nearby temple. The temple near Prabhupada's house is called Radha Govinda temple, it's right on Mahatma Gandhi Road there in Bara Bazaar in the city of Calcutta. And, uh, I remember going there with Prabhupada in 1970, 76 or 77, we went there. Prabhupada went to visit the deities. He told us how he used, used to worship these deities as a child. So Prabhupada got inspired. He saw how they were worshipping, how they were offering arti. And Prabhupada would go home and he would worship his deities because his father had given him the deities. So he was also worshipping them. And with his sister, they would worship. But he said as he grew up, he went to school and college, and he said because of association, he got disconnected. But then, not long after his marriage, he met with Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada, and that reawakened his interest again in the worship of the Lord. Of course, at that time he was recently married and he had young children. He could not take up Krishna consciousness fully. But he remembers the impression was there from the childhood. So sometimes we see the children in Krishna consciousness, you know, they, they grow up and at one point they get separated from the 
what they'd got and we think, oh, I spent so much money on their education, I put them in the Gurukula and they got a good devotional training and now they're not active as devotees. But actually the credit is still there, the samskars are there and gradually, we hope, gradually they'll come back and they'll continue to take up their devotion or the path of devotion. So birth, the, that early connection in the childhood is very powerful. Prahlad Maharaj says, Komar Acharit Pragno Dharmam Bhagavatamya, from the stage of Kumar, five year old. So very important, try to give the children a good education, a good start to life that they can be Krishna conscious from the beginning. Okay, then speaking about the horse sacrifices of Maharaj Yudhisthira, because Maharaj Yudhisthira is worried about the, the sins which he's committed, that so many people have been killed in the battle of Kurukshetra, so Maharaj Yudhisthira is very concerned that he's carrying so much karma. So it was arranged that he would perform three Ashwamedha Yagyas. And Lord Krishna also personally came to be present for these Yagyas. And the Srimad Bhagavatam describes how Maharaj Yudhisthira, what was required to perform the Yagya, Right? Have some of you read it? Have you read what was what were some of the requirements in order to perform the yagya? Somebody knows? Yes, Maharaj, Hare, Hare Krishna. Yes, Prabhu. Let's see what there is. A lot of uh, gold and everything was required. And uh, a lot of ghee and a lot of big arrangements. Brahmanas who could chant uh, mantras properly. So where did he get the gold? He told Arjuna to get it, uh, Arjuna, and uh, he went all over the world and Arjuna and Bhima and then they collected gold. Yeah, in the, in the, in the purports Prabhupada explains about King Maruta. Yes, yes, Maharaj. Right? I think the, in India they have that car, the Marut, right? Maruti. Maruti. Maru, yes. Maruti, yeah, so the Maruti. So they have, this is King Maruta. Uh, so, apparently, when he was a king, he also performed great yagyas. And he got the gold that Prabhupada explains that there's a golden mountain in the Himalayas. There's a whole mountain of gold there. He said, <laughs> he said, this requires some... Uh, Research. <laughs> you should go. Yes. Yes. Somebody wants to say something. No. Okay. I, I, I had a question. The, the chronology on this. He did the jagya after his after Bhishma's departure. I guess. Yes. Yeah, this is after Bhishma's departure. Maharaj Yudhisthira is the ruler, he's the emperor of the world, and he's performing this yagya. Right. And so, it was explained, Maharaj Marut, Maruta, he found the gold mountain and he got the gold. He collected all the gold to use it for the yagya, to do this yagya. Because it cost Billions of dollars, Prabhupada said, so much money is needed to perform this Ashwamedha Yagya. And after they do the Yagya, then he has to give charity to all the Brahmanas. And he gave so much gold to the Brahmanas that the Brahmanas couldn't carry it all. And they just left it. The Brahmanas just left the gold there. And there were gold utensils, everything which was used in the Yagya was gold and it was just left laying there. And the brahmanas also, they could only take a little bit of the gold with them, so they just left a lot of the gold which had been given to them, they just left it there. 
And so for Maharaj Yudhisthira's yagya, Arjuna had to go and he had to find that gold and bring it back that they could use it for the yagya. So it costs so much. So Prabhupada explains, we'll just read here from Prabhupada's purport. Let any man of any place or community, caste or creed be engaged in any sort of occupational duty, but he must agree to perform sacrifices as it is recommended in the scriptures for the particular place, time and person. In the Vedic literature, it is recommended that in Kali Yuga, people engage in glorifying the Lord by chanting the holy name of Krishna without offence. Just a minute, there's a bit more. We have already discussed this more than once in this great literature in different places especially in the introductory portion by sketching the life of Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And still we are repeating the same with a view to bring about peace and prosperity in society. So Prabhupada is pointing out the importance of the yagya, the sacrifice. Everyone has to do some yagya. You have to do some yagya. The sacrifice is very important. So, Kali Yuga, Kali Yuga done, Hari Nam Sankirtan. We have to do the, the yagya, the chanting of the holy name. Any other yagya will not have much effect. But the chanting of the holy name, if it's performed without offence, then very powerful. We just have to get sincere people to participate in the chanting of the holy name. And the Prabhupada mentioned, any place, any community, caste, creed, but everyone has to do some kind of yagya. There has to be that sacrifice. But as Lord Chaitanya says in Shikshastikam, he says, Durdaiva midrishami hajani nanuragaha. He said, although Lord Krishna is so merciful, he's given so many names, it says still, we are very unfortunate that we have no attraction for this chanting of the Holy Name. So this is a problem. Although it's made so easy for us, we just have to chant the Holy Name. We don't have to do anything, just chant the Holy Name. You don't have to know all these Vedic mantras, you don't need a lot of wealth, you don't need all the brahmanas, you just need to chant the Holy Name and you can get all benefit. Everything comes from the Holy Name. So Maharaj Yudhisthira, anyway, he did three horse sacrifices in this way. He felt some satisfaction, some relief from the karma, the reactions. The purpose of the sacrifice, for purification of existence and for the pleasure of the Supreme Lord Krishna, ultimately to give pleasure to Krishna. We don't do the yagya for our pleasure, but by pleasing Krishna, then we become pleased. So the same way when we do Sankirtan, our chanting of the Holy Name, it has to be done for the pleasure of Krishna. And there has to be also distribution of prasadam. It should be very nicely per done, very good distribution of prasadam. That's also very important in any yagya. Okay. Let's see here. Oh, this is going on to the next chapter. Uh, we'll just, we can begin this because the next chapter is, there's quite a lot there also. Just to look into chapter 13, it begins with the appearance of Vidura. You can see a bit of a change. We we're talking about the birth of Maharaj Parikshit. 
Now we're going to hear about Vidura's appearance and we'll hear about Vidura's qualification as an Acharya. Right? This is something you might like to do yourself. You just spend a few minutes, look through the books, and refer to the first verse and verses 14 to 15. And tell us what was Vidura's qualification as an Acharya? Do you want to work in groups or will we just work as individuals? I think you could just work as individuals, individually, just, do you, do you all have a text? Oh, I'll put the text on the, on the screen, I'll share it with you. Hare Krishna says it's Sri Mataji, can you please meet your, uh, yourself? Hare Krishna Tejasuni Mataji. She's not hearing you. Yeah, you can mute her, Prabhu. I don't know if you know how. You can personally beg the voice. What's okay, it? I did.
Okay. So first of all, the history of Vidura, right? But given the information about the identity of Vidura, right? Vidura is Yamaraj. Of course, Yamaraj is also a position. It's a position, it's not an identity. But it's a position which somebody somebody's given that service. So Yamaraj, his job is to punish the sinful people. And we're given the pastime how Manduka Muni got arrested along with some other dacoits. Manduka Muni was a great yogi living in a cave, and some dacoits had come. And they were also hiding in the same cave where Manduka Muni was residing. So it happened by coincidence, the king's men came and arrested the dacoits, and they also arrested Manduka Muni. And he, they all got taken to court and they were sentenced to death. And it's described how at that time there was no uh, there was no hanging, or there was no uh, gas chamber, but they had a system. They had to. They were stuck on some very up, sharp, upraised spikes, and they were put into these spikes. They, I think it's mentioned also in 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 the time of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. One of Ramananda Roy's brothers was also arrested and he was raised, he was go also going to be killed and he had to walk onto these uh, spikes which were up from the ground and he was, he was up there waiting to be pushed out onto these spikes. It's a, a very horrible way to die, really. But this is how they treated this, this, is, this was their death sentence in those days. So that Manduka Muni was arrested and he, he was put on the spike and he was actually on the spike when the king found out what had happened. And the king immediately heard and he rushed there and somehow they managed to get Manduka Muni down, bring him off the spike and they brought him down and the king begged forgiveness and apologized. It was a great mistake and he feels very sorry. So Manduka Muni, he forgave the king, but he wanted to know, he wanted to know how did it happen to him. So he went to see Yamaraj to ask what happened that he had to go through this. Because he thought this month this definitely something to do with Yamaraj. Yamaraj puts us into these different punishments. So he went to see Yamaraj to ask him and Lord Yamaraj told him that when you were a child, you used to take blades of grass and you would pierce insects with them. So, this was the punishment for you because you used to pierce insects as a child, so now you had to be punished that way. So Manduka Muni was not happy. He was upset that, my goodness, what, that I shouldn't be punished like that. I was only a child. Anyway, from that time on, it became customary that children would be forgiven, The children wouldn't get karma. There's a certain age when the person becomes responsible for his actions. But sometimes you, you do get children who are murderers, who, who kill. They've, they do have these kind of cases. They have, you know, child murderers. 
Just like Maharaj Venu. Maharaj Venu, he could kill his friends, you know. He'd play with, his, play with friends, he would kill them. And so, there have been cases like that children who are murderers and generally they're they're not actually responsible but they, they do get restricted they do get punished because it's so dangerous to have them loose in society you can't just leave them to run around freely because they may do the same thing again anyway uh manduka muni was really upset that he'd been treated like this. He thought this was a very harsh punishment. So he cursed Yamaraj that he would become a Sudra. And so Yamaraj came as Vidura. He took birth in the womb of a Sudra lady, but by the simon of Srilavi Asadev. So although he took birth as a Sudra, it was a very special birth. And it was in the royal court in Hastinapur. But he was a Sudra. He was the brother of Dhritarashtra and uh, Pandu. But he was from the Sudra woman. Now, Prabhupada wrote a letter to the GBC and he warned the GBC. He said, you are the managers. They said, you have to be very careful. You may get punished just like Yamaraj to become a Sudra. He said, if you don't deal properly, if you don't deal properly and fairly with people, then you can also be punished. Just like Vidura was punished, just like Yamaraj was punished to become a Sudra. He said, you may also get punished in the same way. Said, so you have to be very careful. He said, this is your responsibility as GBC, that if you're not fair in your dealings and you don't satisfy people, then you, they can curse you, that you may become Sudra. So Yamaraj became Vidura, but as Vidura, it was a blessing for Vidura, because as Yamaraj, he was only meeting sinful people every day. So many sinful people would come and they would have to be punished. So Yamaraj was really, you know, fed up with this kind of service. It's just meeting all these sinful people and punishing them. Okay, you take this one to Kumbhipaka Loka and put them in the boiling oil and so many different hells he had to put people into. Not a very pleasant task, you know. Not very pleasant, really. So, as Vidura, he was in the palace of Hastinapur and it was not so pleasant for him because Dhritarashtra is there with all of his sons and the evil-minded Duryodhan. So Duryodhan, he got really upset with Vidura one day because Vidura was always trying to influence Dhritarashtra that you should be fair to the Pandavas. You should give them some land. You should keep them happy, give them some land. And Duryodhan would come and Duryodhan would say, don't listen to Vidura, he doesn't know anything. This Vidura, he's a nonsense. And he would get really insulting. He said, he's, you know, he's a low class, son of a sudra, son of a, son of a sudrani. He doesn't know anything. He doesn't have royal blood. Don't listen to him. So in this way Vidura was really insulted and actually he was driven out from the palace. Duryodhan kicked him out of the palace. He said, get out, you shouldn't stay here. We don't need you here staying with us in the palace. You go, get, go, get out of here. So Vidura was driven out by Duryodhan. So it was a blessing for Vidura. He saw, he saw the mercy of the Lord that the Lord has put me into this condition, that I've been driven out of my home. I can go to visit all the holy places. Now I can go and find the saintly persons, go and meet the great sages, go and visit the holy places and hear from all the wonderful devotees. 
And so it was a great blessing for Vidura to be put out from the home. His Holiness Mahavishnu Goswami, a very interesting person, he came to Krishna consciousness. He was about maybe 70 when he came to Krishna consciousness. When he officially came, when he fully came to Krishna consciousness, he was older. But he used to say, he, he passed away in his 90s, he used to say, he said, it's better to leave home before they tell you to go, rather than, <laughs> better you go yourself rather than wait until they tell you to go. It's better they say, where did he go, rather than when is he going. If you wait until they say, when is he going, you know, this, this is really difficult, maybe difficult to go. But if you get out on your own, by your own steam, under your own efforts, get out from the home, freed from the entanglement, that's better, that's glorious. And don't wait for them to want to get rid of you, to get you out. So Vidura was out from the home, he was freed and he went to travel and he travelled for 30 years, he travelled. So he was really renounced, he'd been travelling to all the holy places and he met with Uddhava and he met with Maitreya and he got this all in the third and fourth canto, you can read about Vidura meeting with Uddhava and then Maitreya and all the instructions because Buddhava and Maitreya, they had, they had been with Lord Krishna just before Lord Krishna departed from the world. So they had, they had received all the final instructions from Lord Krishna. So Vidura was really blessed to hear all of this. He got so much instruction from Uddhava and then Maitreya. And he's, he's really a renounced, enlightened person. He'd always been good. He'd helped the Pandavas when they were there. He warned the Pandavas that when they were going to stay in the house of Shelak, he warned them, be careful, there's danger there, that home can go on fire. So he'd always been kind and helpful to the Pandavas. And then when he was driven out from Hastinapur, he went traveling, then he got fully enlightened, he became fully real. So he was a renounced person. So what is his position is qualification as an acharya. What do you say? Yes? What is Vidura's quality? How can we understand him as an acharya? Anybody? Why, why would we consider Uddhava suitable as an acharya? Yes, Gand Gand uh, Chandrika uh, Mataji. Because he was educated by Maitreya Muni and because he um, renounced the world for spiritual, for the spiritual enlightenment and uh, he gained the transcendental knowledge and uh, because he was actually Amaraj in his previous Well, I don't know if we can actually credit that as a qualification, that he was Yamaraj in his previous life, therefore he's qualified to be an Acharya today. But we have to look at what the actual qualification. And you've mentioned two very good, very important qualifications, Gyan and Vairagya. Yes, that he had full knowledge, he'd received, been properly trained and educated by a very qualified person, as we said, by Uddhava, then later on by Maitreya. So he had good instruction from them. He'd learned everything, very important teachings he got from them. And then, the, as you also said, that he was re detached, he was renounced. He was just, he had no, he had nothing, he, didn't, he was really niskinchana. He didn't cl claim to possess anything. So his coming back to the palace, he didn't come back to the palace to think, oh, I'm back in the palace, I can enjoy now, I'm back home, I have a good foot here, I'll be, <laughs> I'll be comfortable here in the palace. He didn't come back to the palace for his own benefit, right? Why did he come back to the palace? 
course, his real purpose in coming back was to liberate Dhritarashtra because he knew his brother is still living there and he's living in a, in a very bad situation. He's eating the remnants of, of Bhima and Bhima had killed all of his 100 sons but still Dhritarashtra is eating the remnants of his food and living in the home of the Pandavas. So Vidura is really compassionate on Dhritarashtra and only for that purpose did he come back. And we'll, we will hear how Vidura, he doesn't stay long in the palace. He's ready, as soon as he can convince Dhritarashtra to get out, then they go and they don't tell anybody as well. They, you don't tell people, you don't tell people I'm going to leave home. If you tell them I'm going to, they'll never, no, no, you'll never go. You have to just go. You don't tell anybody about it. You just go. You don't, nobody will give you permission. Nobody will bless you. Forget, forget that idea. Oh, I'll just say my, I'll just see my wife one more time. I'll just say goodbye. No, forget it. You just go. You don't have to worry. Krishna will take care of everyone. So Dhritarashtra and Vidura and Gandhari, they leave and they don't tell anybody. And Vidura wonders, what happened? Where did they go? So, so that is the, the result of association. Dhritarashtra got good association from Vidura. This is the Acharya, that he can, he, he has that potency, that he can influence the mind of the other person to convince them of the need for Krishna consciousness. So we'll go on tomorrow to discuss more about Vidura and Dhritarashtra. Okay, are there any questions? Krishna Guru Maharaj, may I ask one question? Please. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, Maharaj, you said that uh, we should not wait for others to tell us to leave the home. But uh, you also said that when we want to leave the home, nobody is going to give the uh, permission to leave home. So how to understand this contradiction? It's not, it's not a contradiction. It's a fact. That no, you know, if you tell people, I'm going to leave home, they say, oh, no, 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 you just stay here, it's okay. You know, people, they won't encourage you to renounce. They won't encourage, they, they will say, no, you just stay here, it's okay. But you have to be convinced, you have to be convinced of yourself of a better life. You have to be convinced of the need to get out from the home. Because you stay in the home, the attachment is there. If the home is an obstacle to Krishna consciousness, if it's not conducive to our Krishna consciousness, we have to get out. We have to leave it. Yes, John Master May Prabhu? Um, you know, the Sannyas ministry, they've, uh, and this is backed by the GBC, now when someone is that's married and is going to take sannyas, he has to get a sign-off from his wife or ex-wife or whatever. You're, you're aware of that? No, I didn't know that. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Even in old age? I think so. You know, that's, that's my understanding of one of the requirements. You know, they go on a five-year, or they go on a probationary period for older people, then it's less. But um, that's my understanding. I remember, what's his name, uh, from Denmark. Um, Kadamba? Kadamba, uh, Kadamba Kanna? No, 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 no. Well, no, he's from Amsterdam, he's from uh, Holland. But there was another one, I think, when Kadamba Kanna Swami did it, they didn't have that stipulation, the Sannyas ministry formed later because there were so many fall downs. And, um, 
Jeez, I can't think. You know, his son was in Gurukul with my son. And oh. I, I can't remember the names now. But, mm. um, yeah, they, that's part of it now. <laughs> mm. I mean, you know, Sunyas Ministry has done some amazing surfaces. I mean, there's very few fall downs now. And it was just so disturbing and frequent. Yeah. Before. So it's uh, remarkable. And I also, uh, Tamahar, the GBC for Southeast America, he told me that, going back maybe three or four years ago, that the, the statistics were there were a certain number of nominees for sannyas, and something like 50% of them pulled out on their own. They realized this wasn't for me, you know, during their probationary, pro probationary period. I know one who's, a, you know, I've known for years, been a brahmacharya, his whole devotional career, I said, I don't want to do it because I'm going to, you know, I just kept a strong sense I'm going to get puffed up by this position. <laughs> so he pulled out. I mean, super buck, a really good book distributor. I distributed with him for many times. Mm -hmm. Good book distributor, too. So, um, anyway. Yeah, it's not for, time, it's not for everyone. Place, circumstance adjustment, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's not for everyone, definitely. But I, my, my point is, I think... I think a good point is that it's not necessary that you have to officially be the sannyas, but internally you have to have the sannyas. That internally that detachment has to be there and that mood of being a sannyas. And I know several people like that. I know some older brahmacharis. They're very qualified. They're highly qualified. But because of ISKCON and the institution and all the paperwork, it's just such a thing to go through to try to be a sannyasi. It's easier to be a guru than to be a sannyasi in ISKCON nowadays. <laughs> it's easier to get a position as a guru than to be a sannyasi. But to get in sannyasi, it's quite complex. You know, so many things. And so, uh, uh, but he, the, I know many people, they're very good devotees, they're very qualified, but in, although they have all the qualities of sannyasi, they're just happy to be brahmachari, and some are also vanaprastas, but, you know, they're very renounced, very detached. It's not that you have to actually officially be into, initiated into the, the official initiation, not so important, but that mood of renounce, being detached, that's important. There's the uh, Upakurvan brahmachari, you know, the, uh, who, he's brahmachari, then he gets married, but he stays in that same detached consciousness. That's the uh, recommended <laughs> standard of, uh, of Grahastha life. <laughs> <laughs> Not too many wives are happy with that kind of husband. No. <laughs> anyway. We have to have a special wife. <laughs> you can get a lot of service them that way, but uh, you're right. Yeah, difficult. All right, any other questions? Hare Krishna Maharaj, I have one more question. Yes. Can I ask Maharaj with your kind permission? Please do, yeah. Yeah, Maharaj, actually uh, you mentioned that we should not wait for the time uh, uh, to leave the house, uh, like Dhritarashtra was waiting and it is very, very tedious because uh, what happens is the people, they insult the uh, people in, during the old age because they are not able to do their basic duties and uh, they become a liability for the other younger generation. So in that case, uh, uh, as a devotee uh, or maybe trying to practice devotional service in our last days, what is the recommendation? Like, suppose we have to, our house conditions may not be congenial for practicing devotional service. So in that old age, we might not be able to serve uh, the Lord, uh, which we can probably in our earlier days because of the younger body and uh, agile body, in the last days the body may become weak and all that. So where should we go? What is the correct destination? Well, we do have some facilities like that. You know, in Mayapur, for example, they have a senior brahmachari building. A senior brahmachari building, older men. Older men can come and stay there and they do some humble service, they do some simple service. So, 
we, we, we see devotees do like that in their older age. They're not able to do a lot of service, but they take up some humble service, some simple service. You know, maybe like one devotee, maybe giving Charanamrita in the temple, and some other devotees at the book table, like that. There's that is wonderful, Maharaj. That is wonderful. Senior Brahmachari Ashram you mentioned, Maharaj. Yes. We have a senior Brahmachari building and the, the older devotees live there. There's also Kunti Bhavan here in Mayapur and that's for um, older ladies. Yes, right. For older ladies also. Although we don't have a women's ashram, they have an older lady ashram. <laughs> yeah. Try to make some, try to provide for everyone. In Vrindavan also, we see sometimes older devotees there also. I know there was one man, uh, he, he was initiated when I was there in London in 1971. And uh, he was an Indian man and, and he's there now and I don't know if he's passed away yet. He's in very old age now. He's senior to me, he must be in his 80s. He's there in Vrindavan. He was there in Vrindavan and uh, he's doing something there and people help to take care of him because he's an initiated devotee. So he's part of our Krishna conscious family. So we have a duty to them. His family, he has a, he had daughters. His daughters are all right, but they're not full on devotees, not fully devotees. So he came to Vrindavan and he's been there in Vrindavan for a few years. The, the senior Brahmacharya Ashram also permits um, Vanaprastas to stay? I don't know. It would have, have to be looked into. I don't know what is the... the but it's, a, it's a quite a big building. I know there's several rooms there. And I know Janani Vas and Pankajangari, they stay there often. They have a room there. And, uh, I have I have a room there. I get a room there. When I come there, usually I would stay there only this year because of the COVID. They told me to move out because they didn't think it very safe for me during the COVID time. But originally, usually my room was always there in the senior Brahmacharya Ashram. And Radhanath Maharaj, when he comes, he also likes to stay there. Different sannyasis stay there. We do have a number of rooms, it's like three, four floors. Hmm. Yes. So Maharaj, to come to the senior Brahmachari Ashram, uh, they may be asking some qualifications or some uh, qualifying criteria must be there uh, because anybody may not be given entry in the Brahmachari Ashram so that the culture is not spoiled. Yes, it has to be looked into. Has to be looked into. Has to be written. There has, to, you know, the, that's there everywhere. Wherever you go, you want to stay in the temple. You know, we're more cautious these days. We just want, you know. But usually, somebody's initiated. It's not a problem. I think Ravanari. Did you remember him, Jen Master? Me, Ravanari, a, a German. He was, he was a mid. He was a, he was from the Middle East, Beirut. And he translated the, the Bhagavad Gita into Arabic. Then he became a devotee in Germany, proper disciple. So he came there, he stayed there for some time. He left the body, but he was staying there for some time. So it, it definitely, you know, if you're initiated and you're in Krishna consciousness, and you know, and you have a good standard, then it shouldn't be so difficult to arrange. That's the main thing, that you should be steady in Krishna consciousness and recognized. And they do have the facilities. Thank you very much, Maharaj. I'm very grateful to you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada's mercy. All right, any other question, comment? Okay, then we will meet tomorrow afternoon. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada ki. Go back to Vrinda ki. Hare Krishna. How? 
，外边什么样？外面有阳光。哇，我我来了。在外面啊。